It's a passenger's worst nightmare. One minute, this Boeing 737 was cruising at 24,000 feet over Hawaii. The next, it had lost one third of its roof. Only one person died in this bizarre incident, but the remaining passengers must have thought their time had come. They owe their lives to luck and a skillful flight crew. Earlier in the day, a passenger boarding the aircraft spotted a small crack next to the door, but was too shy to speak up. As the Boeing reached its cruising height, the skin of the aircraft peeled back like a sardine can. The aircraft was 19 years old and had spent all its life in Hawaii, flying short hops between the islands. But the airline's maintenance men hadn't noticed the effect that the constant takeoffs and landings were having on the aircraft. The metal panels were tugging apart. There were fatigue cracks everywhere. By the end, the 737 was flying on a wing and a prayer. It doesn't matter how well an aircraft is designed or how well it's flown if it's not looked after properly. Bad maintenance is a significant cause of air disasters. For the airlines, the commercial pressures are now so great that any aircraft on the ground is an aircraft that's not earning money. It's a difficult balancing act and airlines get it wrong at their peril. Everyone knows that a plane crash can bring even the richest airline to its knees. This Boeing 737 is in the hangar for an HMV, a heavy maintenance visit that happens once every five years. It's a complete strip down, almost to bare metal. The potential for one tiny mistake with disastrous consequences is immense. Got one. And the most dangerous time of all is at shift change. Sometimes you go home and you have forgotten Mike's something. It happens every mechanic. And they call up and you call up somebody on the next shift and say, hey, go to this area and check that I did that right. And they will. Nobody just tries to do it on thinking that they're infallible. They're not magical creatures. They're machines. And uh, if there's any mistake anywhere, it's not a car. You can't pull off to the side of the road thing is to minimize it as much as you can. Learning from past mistakes means that there are now systems in place when things are forgotten. Working non-stop, the three shifts complete the major service in just 14 days. Maintenance is a pure loss. The plane's sitting on the ground. It has not got a person sitting in a seat. They're not making any money. At a large airline, it seems that money is no object. You have a component in front of you. It's this big. It doesn't look very, very important, but it, it's more than your yearly salary. The tiniest screws we have on the plane cost over a dollar. One of the most insidious things about a maintenance error is that it can remain hidden for years. Impossible to detect. On August the 12th, 1985, Japanese Airlines Flight 123 waited at Tokyo Airport for the evening flight to Osaka. It was a religious holiday. Many were traveling home to be with their families. 509 passengers squeezed aboard the Boeing 747. Thirteen minutes later, at Tokyo's air traffic control center, an emergency signal began to flash alongside the plane's image on the screen. Oh, Tokyo, Japan Air 123, request from immediate 
Bravo, uh, uh, request the return back to Haneda. Uh, descend and maintain 220, over. Kipenia 123, confirm your declared emergency. That's right. The plane lurched uh, helplessly around the sky. The pilots completely mystified what had happened, but unable to let go of the controls to investigate. But now, on control. On control. Roger, understood. As the hopelessness of the situation began to dawn on the passengers, some began writing farewell notes to their families. My darling wife, life with you has been wonderful. Children, grow up to be people I'd be proud of. I never dreamed that the dinner we had last night would be our last one together. After 32 minutes, the plane gave up the unequal struggle to stay in the air. It went into a dive. One wing clipped a mountain peak, scything through trees. Then it headed straight for the next ridge. Five hundred and twenty people died. The worst single plane crash in history. Remarkably, four people survived. One of them was this flight attendant. A 12-year-old girl was found wedged in a tree, still alive nearly a day after the accident. Flight 123 was an internal Japanese flight, and so foreign investigators wouldn't normally have been involved. But it happened shortly after the mysterious disappearance of an Air India 747 over the Irish Sea. Alarmed at this second loss of a jumbo jet within weeks, the NTSB pressed the Japanese to allow them in. We knew the airplane in Japan had a structural problem, and uh, that brought into question the safety of the 747. Was there a generic flaw that we didn't know about? I believe at the time there were like 650 of them flying worldwide. That put a tremendous pressure on the United States, Boeing, FAA, NTSB, to find out if there was a generic flaw that needed to be fixed. If we grounded the 747, because it had an unknown flaw, we would have had a serious international problem in transportation. So we were trying to find out what happened in Japan very quickly. The first clue to the cause came days later. An amateur photographer had snapped the stricken plane as it passed overhead. Computer enhancement of the photograph appeared to show that a large part of the tailplane, including the rudder, was missing. The surviving flight attendant had been rushed to hospital. From her sick bed, she told of a loud noise at the back of the plane where she had been seated. Part of the ceiling had collapsed and the cabin filled with white mist. There had obviously been an explosive decompression. Ron Schleed paid his first visit to the site. It was an appalling scene, even for an experienced investigator. Very difficult accident site. All these sharp mountains, they're different than the mountains in the United States. They're very steep, they're very sheer. The airplane was scattered amongst these uh, uh, sharp peaks and valleys. Early on, the Japanese people arranged to memorial services and visits by family members to the accident site. All over the site, there were little religious shrines that had been built with uh, little stones and things piled up and then there would be a, a picture or a, a keepsake, a, a medal or something. And then there was the offerings there. There would be food and, and fruit. Um, those were scattered throughout the, the accident site. And the other thing that did happen while we were there, they were bringing the family members uh, by helicopter overhead. They weren't bringing them into the uh, site. Occasionally, these helicopters would come over, hover real high, and then they were dropping flowers onto the accident site. So it was very um, impressive to see that. Of course, 520 people died.
the investigators were working in the most difficult conditions they had ever met. Not only the precipitous mountain slopes, but hostility from the police, who were insisting it was their investigation and no wreckage was to be removed. Feelings ran high against Boeing. The Japanese um, were extremely cautious about letting uh, Boeing. They didn't want Boeing to be there, certainly unescorted. Uh, initially, they were reluctant to have Boeing there, but we assured them that they, we always worked with them and we were able to convince them that we needed the expertise of Boeing to be our advisor. So the only stipulation was that Boeing had to be very close to us. They couldn't wander off. As a matter of routine, the NTSB men examined the plane's maintenance record. There, they made an ominous discovery. Seven years earlier, this plane had banged its tail along the ground whilst landing. It had been extensively damaged. Boeing maintenance men had been called in to repair it. The critical repair they'd made was to the rear pressure bulkhead. The bulkhead, which resembles a huge metal umbrella laid on its side, stops pressurized air escaping from the back of the cabin. It had been cracked in the bad landing, so the Boeing men had riveted on a new section. Part of our team was a, was a, was a fractures mechanics metallurgist, a very, a, what they call a national resource specialist, Tom Swift, who worked for the FAA. He didn't go to the accident site. He was not the type that was, he just didn't go to the accident site. He was there to help us. And we studied the repair documents as to how it had been repaired and came up with some theories. One theory was that if the rivets weren't put in properly and instead of being two rows of rivets taking up uh, the two pieces of metal, if they weren't put together right, only one row of rivets, that would be half strength. It would have half the strength. Well, Mr. Swift had the ability to make calculations on uh, what this meant. His analysis was that if this wasn't put together right and it was one row of rivets, that joint would fail at a certain predicted number of takeoffs and landings. Every time the airplane takes off and lands, it's pressurized, it flexes the metal. But his calculations were very close, within 5% of what that airplane had actually flown since the repair. So we had a pretty good suspicion what to look for. So the next day when we went to the accident site, we definitely focused on the tail it became obvious all of a sudden that this joint had been put together improperly, that there was only one row of rivets taking up two pieces of these metal. That means it was half strength, and it, would, it failed at the time it was, would have been predicted to fail by uh, Tom Swift's calculations. Um, what we call that in the, in the business is, is finding the golden nugget. The Boeing maintenance men had botched the repair. They'd only fastened the new piece of bulkhead with a single row of rivets. The bulkhead was therefore only at half strength. Over the years, the numerous takeoffs and landings had weakened this single row of rivets. Tiny fatigue fractures had spread out from behind each rivet. And the structures engineer from Boeing who was, I, I forget his exact title, but he was Boeing 747 Structures, um, uh, reacted, as you would expect, uh, very, uh, uh, very upset and concerned because this repair and this design and, and everything was his responsibility at Boeing as the structure's primary person for Boeing. It was a very emotional uh, time. It was for all of us, but certainly for him because he, when he, the realization that the people that did this repair after the accident had put it together wrong, and it was really why the airplane came down. It was very emotional, and he got very upset, and I understand why. Thirteen minutes into the flight, as the plane reached maximum pressure, the tiny fatigue fractures growing behind each rivet finally joined up. The pressure bulkhead shattered like a plate. Air from the pressurized cabin blasted through into the tailplane and blew it away, rudder and all. The plane's four hydraulic lines all meet in the tail and were torn out. Precious hydraulic fluid bled away into the atmosphere. The pilots never had a chance. 
the Japanese engineer who had sanctioned the repair committed suicide. Boeing later made a full public apology for their mistake. Four years later, an almost identical situation was to arise on the other side of the world that would present the pilots with another mission impossible. What Janice and Dale Sorensen would find would be the most significant clue in solving one of the most dramatic of recent air accidents. Right behind us, if you follow us, you'll see right where the spot was that fell. I think it was just right in here, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, it is. It was. Yes, it was. Yeah, because the right combine here. was there. Right here. Now, this is the area right in, in here, spot. give or take maybe 50 feet, 75 feet. Sitting in first class, catching a ride home to Chicago, was a United Airlines senior DC-10 captain, Denny Fitch. We were at 37,000 feet. Uh, it was a lunch flight, and after lunch had been served, a cup of coffee was placed in front of me. And, uh, and at that time, they took that opportunity to turn the uh, short subject on to watch. And very shortly after that time frame, there was a loud, muffled explosion. It wasn't a subtle thing, it was a very abrupt and very loud. It was not long after uh, Pan Am 103 was downed over Scotland by a terrorist bomb, and I thought, a bomb has gone off, and uh, we're, all gonna, we're all gonna perish at this point. I never even gave it a second thought. I just sat down on the floor and held on because I didn't know what it was. I was kind of sitting sideways in the seat and had a cup of coffee in my hand. And when, as soon as the engine blew, with the explosion, Bill grabbed the controls. So, okay, that's taken care of it. He's gonna fly the airplane. At first, it seemed to be an engine failure. Unusual, but an event that all pilots train for. To lose an engine in a commercial airplane, probably that's the most trained maneuver we do in our simulators for emergency practice. And I know that our pilots are extremely proficient at operating in this fashion if it becomes necessary. And it wasn't because of that confidence in the pilots. You don't run to help. It's not necessary. They're trained for it. I've never lost a jet engine in flight. I've been flying jets since 1968, never had an engine fail. But still, through the training we had, you just follow the procedure. And the procedure is, he flies the airplane, and we shut the engine down. And so that's what we started to do. And while we're in that process, then we begin to realize that the situation was worse than we thought. Now the goddamn elevator's done. Very nice. Oh, elevator, hard. Rudder. Oh, shit. Oh, Alan, we're going to uh, slow this. As the aircraft appeared to be out of control, Denny Fitch offered his help to the captain, Al Haynes. When I looked forward, I looked over the engineer's shoulder, and on the panel where they keep all the hydraulic equipment or, or gauges for it, uh, we have three hydraulic systems that are in the aircraft main systems, and all three quantity gauges and all three pressure gauges were indicating zero. Now that's an, that's an occasion you will only see on the ground at the gate with the engine shut down. My name is Al. I'm Al Hayden. Hi, Al. Denny Fitch. Hi there, Denny. Yeah. 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 We'll have a beer record on that. Well, I don't drink, but I'll see what you have. Yeah. Little right turn. Little right, right turn. Little right turn. All right. The first officer and the captain were both pushing on the control yoke, trying to get the nose down because it was climbing, and they wanted to get the nose down. And they pushed full forward, and I can distinctly remember the first officer slouched in his seat with his knee place firmly under the control column to put even more leverage on the forward moment of it, and it wasn't affecting it at all. When we fly airplanes and we want to make a turn, the device is looking from behind their ailerons, and these are located here, and they're flippers. They come up and down as necessary. But in all cases in a normal aircraft, if this one comes up to put this wing down, then this one goes the opposite direction, down to assist it. So they always work opposite each other. If one goes up, the one on this side goes down. If this goes up, then this one goes down. When I looked at it, these two ailerons in these two locations were both floating up in the same direction at the same time. 
and that is that was distinctly not normal and obviously a conf confirmation of what we saw in the cockpit. Unlock that fucking door. Unlock it. Pull back, pull back. We've lost them. No, we have no hydraulic fluid. That's part of our main problem. Both your inboard ailerons are sticking up. That's more than I can tell. I don't know that's well, that's because we're, we're, we're turning maximum return. Yeah. So I have some steering here. Help me. Yes, okay. Yes, Go ahead and help. Just don't worry about it. Tell me yell what you want. I'll, I'll help you. Right. Uh, close one. Put two up. What we need is some elevator control, and I don't know how to get it. As a last resort, and the only thing that seemed to work is the captain in the cockpit had the throttle for this engine, pulled it to idle, the left one. This one, he pushed it to full power, and because of the location of the engine, it had a tendency to pick up this wing at maximum power. And he was having a terribly difficult time doing that because the number two engine, its throttle, because of the explosion and the way it failed, it jammed in the upright position. So it became an obstacle for him to operate around the other two throttles. I saw that, I saw how difficult it was for him to do all this, and I wasn't doing anything at the time, and I said, Captain, would you like me to do your throttles for you? To which Captain Haynes replied, yes, please do that. It just was kind of natural for him to just step in and, and start doing the, the throttles, which ended up being what flew the airplane. Just as in Japan four years earlier, the plane had lost all hydraulics and flight controls. Danny Fitch thought it might be possible to maneuver the DC-10 using engine thrust. If I wanted to go to the right, I'd reduce thrust on this engine, increase thrust on this engine, and by pushing harder on this side, the airplane would tend to go this way. Of course, the opposite was the problem. Our airplane wanted to go right all the time, and we didn't want it to. So I had to keep more power on this engine and less on this engine just to counteract this tendency to want to go this way. I was trying to keep the wings level. As well as wanting to bank to the right, the aircraft was lunging through the sky in what's called a fugoid. The airplane would go in like in a sine wave. It would climb, change direction, descend, then it would climb. And those magnitudes of those efforts up and down would be at 2,500 feet per minute on average. And the cycle seemed to operate at about a minute apart. So you'd finish one at the top and then it would start down. And then you get to the bottom after a minute and it would go back up again. As Denny Fitch managed to control the direction of the aircraft, the crew found themselves heading for the small town of Sioux City, Iowa. United 232, Sioux City. We have no hydraulic fluid, which means we have no elevator control, uh, almost done, and very little aileron control. I have serious doubts about making the airport. He was about 40 miles northeast of Sioux City, which is just farmland out there. And uh, he was just making big right 360s, losing altitude the whole time. He, the plane was totally uncontrollable at this point. And, uh, you know, while I was talking to him in between our conversations, our transmissions, you know, I told my supervisor, you know, 300 people are going to die and there's nothing we can do about it because and it was obvious, I mean, that they were going down. We have almost no control here. We have no hydraulic control. We're going to go to Sioux City and we're going to try and put it into Sioux City, Iowa. Well, we're going to have the gear down, yeah. and if we can keep the airplane on the ground and it stops standing up, right. give it a second or two before you're back. We're going to be done. We're going to have 1,500. Come back. Brace. The brace will be the signal. It'll be over the PA system. Brace, brace, brace. And then if we have to evacuate, you'll get the command signal to evacuate, but I really have my doubts with me and stand it up, buddy. Good luck, sweetheart. Okay. Lock up and put everything away. But for the most part, you know, they were calm, collected, which, considering what was going on, was unbelievable. There was no panic. It just, you know, I don't think we, we knew enough to, to panic. Uh, we just, we were just trying to keep the airplane flying. It's, it's so hard to explain because everybody pictures all kinds of things going on in their mind. And it was just, what is the next step to keep this airplane in the sky? And why is it in the sky? If a situation was the way it was supposed to be, we shouldn't be in the sky. It's a corny adage, but I, I think your attitude determines your altitude. And if you think you can't, then you won't. And uh, I believed with my whole heart we were going to pull this off. I really did. Help me turn this so we know what he's doing. Back, back, back. Let's start down. We have to heat it down. We've got to heat it down. Okay. 
I noticed that there was a cornfield at the far end, and I thought, well, okay, if we can get this thing on the runway with just some engine reverse, captain standing on the little bit of brake pressure we had, if we could keep it steering straight down the runway, we're probably not going to be able to stop. We may go into the cornfield. And I thought, okay, we're going to open eight doors. Well, we stop. It's going to come to rest, wings level. The doors are going to open. The slides are going to inflate, and we're all going to walk off this thing fine. Uh, on the squatters on the His wheels were down, his nose were up, his wings were level. Looked like it was going to be just a fast landing. You know, he'd roll off to the end of the runway to evacuate the aircraft. And I really thought we'd all be home for supper that night. I really didn't think. Of course, it doesn't happen in your town. It doesn't happen to you. At the end of the runway, it's just a wide open field. Post Somewhere around 400 feet above the ground, and we're going so fast, the captain said, pull the power off, meaning let's get rid of some of the speed. And I said, I can't. That's what's holding your wing up. I looked down at the captain's vertical speed indicator, and I saw it at 1,800 feet per minute, which was intolerable. We couldn't hit that hard. And in a desperate effort, I firewalled both the engines, shoved both the throttles up to full power, and the time factor wasn't there for us. saw the airplane on final and it's like man he's gonna make it and uh, I mean everybody was just stunned when it hit I mean we couldn't believe it was it was like slow motion I mean, the plane was probably going 220 knots and you know we knew we were gonna, it was gonna hit hard but we expected him to make it for 30 minutes I built up inside me this wall saying all these people are gonna die and all of a sudden they're all gonna live and then think again, suddenly they're all gonna die again. And I just felt like my heart had been ripped out. We just dropped out of the sky and hit the ground. I mean, it, it felt like we slammed into the earth. And immediately, I mean, within seconds after the initial impact, I saw flames, I saw smoke, I saw people still strapped in their chairs being thrown around in the cabins, people thrown out of their chairs being thrown around the cabin. And uh, I mean, within a few seconds, there was a lot of chaos, there was a lot of destruction, and there was probably some death uh, immediately upon that impact. I saw the corn stalks going by Captain Haynes's window. And the strangest thought crossed my mind is, my God, they really do grow up that tall in Iowa. And of course, the bad news was that a normal DC-10 captain sits 22 feet in the air. And I know they didn't grow it that tall. So I knew that something bad had probably happened to our undercarriage or our landing gear. I remember tearing of metal. I remember now very loud shrieking engine noise. Noises that that you've never heard before and you hope you never hear again. It was horrendous. The, these strange, shrieking noises. And we went straight ahead for a period of time and then we veered to the right into a soybean field. And uh, it's almost as if somebody had kicked you from behind and you could feel your body, your whole body went forward as if you were going over the top. When we started to go over, uh, I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I know this airplane is starting to roll. I felt heat, humidity, and debris. And after that, it was just one of the most, I can't begin to describe in words how violent it was after that. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't smell anything. Nothing was working except my mind. Uh, it was like total body detachment or, or being in a protective cocoon. Um, I then realized that two-thirds of me was suspended in fire and I felt this is this is it this is how I'm going to go on this is how I'm going to die and it was uh, the most incredibly peaceful moment I've ever known that uh, I was in no pain I had no fear anymore it was total peace
never forget, the first survivor I saw was this little kid, uh, maybe 10, 12 years old. And then there was this woman uh, wearing a dress, and they were both kind of laying on the field, and then they set up. They'd been tossed out of the aircraft. And they set up, and they got up, and they started walking to me. And my first, my first reaction was, didn't somebody tell these people that this airplane was going to crash? I thought these were people out here on the airfield for some kind of a, a field day or a field trip or something. I, because as you watch the airplane crash, you couldn't imagine that anybody lived from that crash. So I thought these people were hit by debris. I couldn't believe it. I, and then behind them, more people begin to set up. And then it, the reality set in that, yeah, these are, these are people from the aircraft that are actually sur survived this event, you know, uh, and, are in, and most of them in need of medical care. But still, to this day, it's amazing that anybody survived that crash. I opened my eyes and I couldn't recognize a thing. It was like waking up on a foreign planet. I was thinking, I'm still thinking. In other words, I'm still alive. And then it was right back to work. Um, we've got to get out of here. There goes life like that. Behind me, I heard someone say, there's an opening. I immediately went back where I had heard that voice. And surely enough, people were walking out into a cornfield. It was surreal. I could have been saying, Thank you very much for flying with us today. And they were going slowly, and in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, this could blow up at any minute. I wish they'd move faster. And we're taught that when the fire is too hot, the water's too deep, and the smoke is too thick that you leave. So there was no question of me going in to, to look for anyone else, because it was deadly. I, I, that's when I left. The seriously injured were separated from the walking wounded. There was no trace of the flight crew. They didn't find us for 30 minutes because the thing was such a big mess that they didn't think it was an occupied portion of the airplane. They thought it was the avionics compartment where all the radio gear was because all you could see were wires and cables. We came to rest inverted and uh, our second officer in his position had a hole. He was able to get a hand up and put a little bit of insulation in the air, and he kept waving it. And finally, after about 30 minutes, uh, one of the rescuers saw the hand, saw the, saw the insulation, came over in his truck to look into it. And he was informed by our second officer that there was four pilots in here. This was the cockpit. When you see the, the wreckage of the cockpit, yes, it's a miracle we got out of there. It's a miracle any of us survived. And we had passengers come off of that airplane without a scratch on them. Out of 285 passengers, 184 survived the Sioux City crash. I was told that I was touch and go for quite a bit of time during the night. Uh, the next morning, my wife and child came over, my youngest child came over, and uh, when she came into intensive care, uh, I asked her two questions, and uh, I said, did I make the runway? And. Uh, She said, yeah you, yeah, you made the runway, because I knew our salvation was there. That's where the equipment was, and if we were going to live, we had to make the runway, so it meant everything to me. And the second question I asked her, I said, is everybody else okay? And she started to cry, her eyes filled with tears, and she, I had my answer. And I think I cried for three days on and off. I just, it was just terrible. It was, the survivor's guilt was incredibly bad. I really wanted to die so that they could live. I would make, make the trade with God so they would survive. It meant everything to me, and uh, it just wasn't to be, I can't play God, I guess. I don't know, it, it, you just don't have a chance to think it all through yet. You had no concept of loss of life until we were gonna evacuate on a shuttle bus. 
and then walk back through an open area and you just you just saw you saw the people some of them were covered and some weren't and there was just debris everywhere one person actually found their suitcase laying in the corner picked it up and walked away and how, how ironic were you in the back of the plane or the front of the plane where were you sitting at right in the middle right in the middle and you basically just walked away I did from about row 9 to about row 20 almost everybody got out and then from about 20 to 25 I don't know how many rows there were but from 20 to 25 26, 27 a lot of people got out but I haven't met a single person that was in front of row 9 which was first class I haven't met anybody from first class at all Before the National Transportation Safety Board investigators could start work, the rescue teams had to clear the charred wreckage of bodies. We must not forget that 111 people perished in this accident. And to their families and their friends, I would like to say that this crew, and in fact the entire industry, is dedicated to finding the cause of this accident, so maybe we can never have it happen again. The NTSB investigator in charge, Bob McIntosh. The wreckage was spread out all over the airport for probably the better part of three quarters of a mile. And the airport was uh, covered with crops in the growing areas. Consequently, the wreckage was embedded in a cornfield which was a bit surprising for us. We just had not thought about that for an airport situation. And we were able to immediately see the uh, initial impact points of the, uh, of the aircraft at the end of the, uh, the closed runway where it landed and uh, follow up uh, to where the cockpit uh, section was and up to the tail section and then this large section of fuselage that was over on the side. Now this is what we call a, a core engine. And up in front, I told you to look at that fan up at the other engine and I took this and pointed at it and said, you're going to see what's missing now. That whole fan area is missing. That whole damn fan area. And this is a, a large, large piece of, of equipment. And when it goes, if it's spinning at a, at a high RPM, it's got a, it's got a kinetic energy that's, that's really something. It's really something. Nobody's going to solve an accident in the first 30 minutes or the first day. Consequently, sticking with the uh, rules of investigation means that you count all four corners of the airplane and you look for all the ground scars you can find. Consequently, uh, uh, we had our performance team out at the, uh, at the original point of uh, contact. We had our engine people looking carefully at the, uh, at particularly at the number two engine. We had our structures people uh, looking at the tail where we saw the damage uh, that had been done from the rotating parts. And we had lots of people looking for the things that might have fallen off the airplane. And indeed, one of those parts came uh, into very uh, prominent notice to us one of the hydraulic lines. The investigators knew very early on that the tail engine's fan disc had disintegrated and spun out and sent shrapnel through the tailplane. The hydraulic lines were severed, the flight controls useless. But they didn't know why, and they couldn't find the fan disc. As the accident unfolded, it became obvious that the fan disc in the number two engine was missing. And also, it was known that the hydraulic systems were damaged and things of that nature. So uh, it became a giant search to try to find uh, the, these disc pieces. And they're large. The disc itself is a 300-pound uh, titanium forging. And on top of that, there are these fan blades that stick out. And the whole thing is very big, very heavy. Uh, so these pieces, you would think, uh, when they fell to earth, they would be obvious and that you would walk up and find them. But with the Iowa cornfields stretching for miles on end, uh, no one could find them. They did aerial searches and all types of things. They had jet planes flying over with radar looking for it. And there was jets flying over this area right above the corn, big jets. Three months after the crash, Janice Sorensen found the vital clue as she was combining her corn. I just backed the combine up, then I could see some of the blades protruding out, and uh, 
I started crying <laughs> because I knew how important it was. Uh, one more. <laughs> this was the whole, oh. I come on the combine and the combine, that was resistance and back up. Oh, my gosh, this is it. This is it. I couldn't believe it. So I came to the house. Dad had gone to town with a load of corn, and um, then I called the sheriff's office and talked to Jerry Clark and told him, and he said, did you really find it? And I said, yes. And he knew I was really emotionally upset, so he said, take a Valium and sit down and we'll be right out. General Electric, the engine manufacturers, had offered a reward for any parts found by the local farmers. We washed off the fan disc at the turkey shed. And I said, what's this? And it was a bolt that had been sheared off. He says, that's $500. He says, don't throw that away. The Sorensons found engine parts that earned them $120,000 in reward money, but they gave most of it to charity. The broken fan disc, similar to this new one, was examined by the NTSB's senior metallurgist, Jim Wildy. In order to find out how the fan disc broke, it's simply a fractographic examination. That means looking at the fracture surface, trying to find the details of the fracture that, that lead an investigator uh, or an experienced eye to follow the features back to an origin area. On the fan disc, the features were very easy to read. There was a radiating pattern that stemmed or emanated right from the bore of the disc, the hub portion of it. And uh, in that area, we could see there was a pre-existing fracture region. Uh, that, that was the source of the cause of the fracture for the fan disc. This type of defect is called a hard alpha inclusion. And it's referred to as hard alpha because it's a very brittle and a very hard defect inside the material. Jim Wildy didn't understand why there should be a defect when there were several inspections of the disc during the manufacturing process. The titanium material is subject to a large number of inspections. Uh, during the manufacturing process, before they even make a part, the billets, these elongated ingots, are ultrasonically inspected. Unfortunately, if the uh, defect that you're looking for is right adjacent to the surface, the ultrasonic inspection isn't really capable of t detecting that type of anomaly. After extensive examination, the flaw in the rotor disc was found to be the size of a grain of sand. It had been sitting in the disc since it was manufactured 17 years before the day of the crash. It's, uh, it's a very surprising uh, realization that something as small as a very small grain of sand can bring down an airplane as big as a, a major transport aircraft. But uh, in, the, uh, in the knowledge of metallurgy and the knowledge of uh, rotating parts, uh, it, uh, it proved to be a possibility that uh, became a reality. Although the flaw in the disc happened during manufacture, the United Airlines maintenance team were harshly singled out for criticism in the NTSB's report. United's maintenance inspectors had failed to spot the flaw in all of their routine inspections. In the end, said the NTSB, it was all down to human errors. We are still not satisfied that the report reflects the things that really happened. Uh, the disc was defective at delivery and that uh, we believe we did everything as a company possible uh, to inspect. I've, it happened before my time as, uh, as director of safety and uh, I have gone out personally and gone through the inspection line. I've talked to the people who were involved. Um, uh, we still at United do not accept that there was anything further we could have done. The crash at Sioux City was the result of an extraordinary chain of events, a one in a billion chance. We have an adage in aviation safety that says that if you break any link in the chain, you've broken the accident. The accident won't happen. But once that, once that you know, if you, if you haven't broken this chain of events that start, in this case, the flaw in the disc, the flaw in the disc caused the disc to fail. The disc failure causes parts to fly to the engine. The parts fly to the engine, it punctures a horizontal stabilizer. When it does that, what are the odds of it hitting two hydraulic system lines? And it did that as well, and it punctured those too. It all happened in a quarter of a second, and it all started with that small defect in the, in the rotor disc. So it went from a rotor disc problem, to an engine problem, to a hydraulic problem, to a loss of control problem. Flight control, again, 
the trail goes right back to the little defect in the disc. Today, Al Haynes is retired and Denny Fitch still flies for United Airlines. For the flight attendant, Jan Brown, the crash led to a personal crusade. As she prepared the passengers for the emergency landing at Sioux City, she went through the standard procedure, showing each mother how to hold their child firmly on the floor in front of them. On impact, all the children were thrown forward as far as 15 rows away. One small boy died. That little boy would be alive today if he'd been in a seat. But because the FAA says children under two can fly for free and sit on a parent's lap, that's what we have. I guess at one point I probably did go through a certain amount of survivor guilt. But uh, and I did realize that I was still here for a purpose. And that purpose is to see that all passengers are safe on airplanes, not just once they've arrived at the golden age of two, and I will pursue it tenaciously and relentlessly until the FAA mandates it. Thankfully, crashes like Sioux City are rare occurrences. Flying is still statistically the safest way to travel. Quite frankly, the danger that I face every day when I go to work is between my driveway and the parking lot. More people are going to try to kill me between now here and O'Hare tomorrow in, an air, in a car. Once I'm upstairs, I'm among professionals. We play by the same rules, and we're out there doing the very best we can to be safe and to do it well and professionally. And I feel very, very safe upstairs. Statistically, emotionally, any way I want to look at it, I'd much rather be upstairs than down here on a safety issue. It's dangerous down here. <laughs> Next week's Black Box finds out what happens when the pilot's to blame at the same time, 9 o'clock. The book Black Box costs $14.99 and is available from most bookshops.